everyone, and welcome to the Dales Report. Uh, today I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Manish Agrawal, a board-certified oncologist at Maryland Oncology Hematology, where he is the co-director of clinical research and where he worked on a recent study focused on depression, uh, pardon me, depression in cancer patients using psilocybin therapy. Um, first, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how are you doing today, uh, Dr. Agrawal, and where are you joining us from? Uh, Hi, Amanda. I'm doing really well. I'm um, joining you from our, my office in Rockville, Maryland. Wonderful. Um, so I, I'm really thrilled to have this conversation. There's so much science coming out around um, psilocybin. I'm really intrigued by uh, your role and what you do. So I'm wondering first if you could um, tell our audience a little bit about uh, your background in healthcare, your work as an oncologist, and, um, and your work in this recent clinical trial. Yeah, so I'm a medical oncologist, as you said, I trained at the uh, NCI and was on faculty there and then I've been in practice uh, seeing cancer patients for almost 20 years now and uh, um, been doing research, more oncology research, but over the years mm -hmm. they've, I've come to appreciate more and more the uh, emotional distress that having a cancer diagnosis causes for my patients and realize that so much of that is unaddressed and mm -hmm. so a few years ago, I became more and more interested in that and then read about the research that's going on with psychedelics, went up to Johns Hopkins and met with Roland Griffiths and, you know, with Mary Casamano and became very, even more intrigued and then um, ended up writing a study and helped build out a center in our cancer center upstairs. It's called us uh, Bill Richard Center for Healing and it's a purpose-built space, really the first one in the country. Uh, that's dedicated to doing psychedelic research, and uh, we launched a clinical trial using psilocybin uh, for cancer patients last year. Wow, so that's incredible. This goes further than the study then. You have an entire purpose-built center. Uh, would you say then that this area specifically is like your, your, your main focus, uh, depression in, in cancer patients? Sounds like that's something you're really passionate about. Yeah, I mean, I would say, um, depression or literally any emotional distress, even trauma and cancer patients and their families, to be to be honest with you, it's mm -hmm. beyond just, because the impact mm -hmm. is on more than just the patient, it's also on the family member. Absolutely, yeah, it definitely takes a toll. Um, I'm wondering if you could go in a little bit to the structure of this study. Um, actually, before that, well, we, we're, we're sort of talking about the basis. Um, let's touch on that a little bit more. So how common is depression among cancer patients? Uh, and why isn't this something we're, we're only really starting to talk about uh, in earnest now? Why haven't we addressed it sooner? Um, the first answer to your question, you know, studies have suggested that depression is probably anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of cancer patients have some symptoms of depression. Um, and I think in terms of why, I think it's a great question. And it's something that I really learned to appreciate after doing the study or during the study. And actually, I have this concept I talk about called the collusion of denial. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that there is this denial that goes on about the depression that cancer patients mm -hmm. face. And I think it extends from the patient all the way up through the healthcare system. And And what I mean is that even the patient that has cancer and maybe has depression has a hard time admitting it to themselves and um, partly because they're busy you know and they have to take care of their family and getting through the day and so do they really want to open up that box there's still a little bit of a stigma around it and a lot of not a lot of people can really handle that so I think they a lot of times cancer patients will put it away put it in a closet even though it sort of seeps out and then you know, when they see an oncologist or come to the office, you know, they're getting shuffled through the system, getting vitals, and they see the doctor for 15 minutes, and, you know, we're not really trained to talk about it and think about it, and frankly, it takes up a lot of time, and we don't have the skills necessarily always. Um, and then, you know, and then I've thought even in some ways the institutions and society uh, doesn't recognize it because if you realized how serious it was, you'd have to probably address it more seriously. And, and also, finally, I think we've had limited tools. You know, even when people have it, you know, how do you deal with it? Just talking about it sometimes isn't enough. And so I think it's a combination of um, an unconscious denial 
because it's just an easier way to get through the day, uh, plus limited tools. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think that last point really really hits for me. The limited tools. I mean, even for people that don't have a cancer diagnosis, we struggle to to help people with depression and and trauma. So I can imagine that as a patient, when when you're dealing with all of these compounding health issues, yeah, I uh, I can see why the tendency to sort of put it aside is there. Um, I want to jump now into the study. So um, if you could tell me a little bit about um, the structure, so the number of participants, um, and the outcomes. Um, what did the results show about the efficacy of psilocybin-assisted therapy for patients uh, with depression? Sure. I mean, um, ours is a little bit of a novel design in that um, we treated, we did what was called group uh, treatment. And so this is the first study that's actually treated patients with uh, group intervention. And so mm -hmm. we allowed anywhere from two to four participants, so all of our cohorts that either had four or three cancer patients, and they would come, they would get um, assessed to see if they were qualified for the study, and if they had depression and they had cancer, then they were uh, enrolled on the study, assuming they met all the other criteria with blood work and EKGs and things like that. And then there was two preparatory sessions where one preparation was with the cancer patient and the therapist. And then the second one was with group, and so all four people would be in a room together with the therapist and talk about how the cancer impacted them and get them ready for treatment the next day. Then all four would come in, and we have four treatment rooms, and so all would take psilocybin at the same time, even though they're in separate rooms right next to each other, and they could hear mm -hmm. each other, and they'd have this experience simultaneously. Wow. And then the next day they came back for an integration all together and talked about their experience, and then a week later they came back together for another integration. And so we wanted to, so it was a group study, and that was the end. So we treated 30 people, uh, all cohorts of four or three. Uh, so I just wanted to know a little bit about um, the group model. Uh, what were some of the other sort mm -hmm. of benefits that, that people saw? Were there some maybe drawbacks? Um, can we talk a little bit about m more about that aspect? Because I think there's some serious value there, and I'm, I'm uh, yeah sure. excited to see that it's being studied yeah, I mean, more. It was really uh, it was one of the most rewarding findings of the study, to be honest with you, in that um, initially we had done group for two reasons. One, it was we thought group might be more effective, but second, in terms of improving access for people, having two therapists to one, which has been the traditional, is going to be more difficult to scale. And so we yeah. wanted to try this one-on-one -on -one model. Um, and so it proved to be safe. Yeah. But surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, it was incredibly uh, rewarding for the participants to be in a group where other people have the same experience and had struggled with cancer and to hear them share their stories and their struggles and to be witnessed that way was very therapeutic and they connected in such a deep and profound way and an example of that is even though it's the study ended after eight weeks after taking psilocybin and, yeah. um, and so the group would end typically but because the people have connected so much, they've continued to meet. So even a year later now, the people are still meeting as a group. Some of them become friends, they have coffee. Mm -hmm. And so I think it allowed them to really open up and share this experience together. And so um, I think group is a very powerful modality that needs to be explored further. Hmm. That's really uh, exciting. To yeah, I think suffering through an illness and then having an experience like that together allows people to open up and share, and that sharing is healing for others and for yourself. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. That's that's blowing my mind, um, and that's so so great to hear. So I want to ask, um, I mean, you mentioned that this study focuses on uh, safety. So what's next? You've, al you've also mentioned that maybe this group model needs to be explored further. So for you, what are, what are you looking forward to um, studying next? Yeah, so I mean, the first thing was safety and efficacy, but then we did look at um, depression scores, and so we uh, used something called the MADRAS, which is a clinician-administered scale to measure people's level of depression. Okay. And uh, and we're right in the process of writing up the manuscript now, but uh, we found incredible results, albeit it's 30 people and mm -hmm. a single institution, so it has those limitations. but. Um, 80% of the people had more than a 50% reduction in their depression scores based on Madras. So that's a pretty dramatic improvement. Um, mm -hmm, that's huge. And so I think the next phase of this is um, 
is to uh, design a multi-center study with more than one center in a larger group with probably randomization, so a control arm, whether it's traditional therapy, to show that it's better and then hopefully lead to a, a FDA approval. Mm. Awesome. Um, so one one last question for you, Dr. Agarwal. Um, if the research pans out and shows that you know this could be beneficial for this kind of work, um, and and it's something that we imagine is going to be included more broadly in a cancer patient's treatment, um, how do you envision it sort of being conducted? Like where would it fit in, and at what point in a person's um, diagnosis or treatment journey, if you will, would they uh, begin to receive psychedelic assisted therapy? after being diagnosed with cancer? Sure. Um, yeah, I think that, that's a great question. And so one of the things that we've learned is that, uh, so we, our patient, our, our study was also a little bit different that we had patients with advanced cancer as well as early stage cancer. Okay. And what we found is that it really seems to help people that are facing death and are likely gonna die of the cancer, but it also seems to help people that have had cancer and mm -hmm. are cured from it and what I would call survivorship issues. And so I could see it fitting in <clears throat> to people. I think there's almost three populations of cancer patients that potentially could benefit. One is if you're newly diagnosed, you're having a lot of distress, trying to assimilate that. But a second group that is very common, it's underappreciated, is you had cancer two years ago. And, and I just saw a woman yesterday, in fact, she had breast cancer, and she's almost five years out, and she said, you know, I look good, and I'm, I mean, says, oh, you look great, you know, but she says, I'm having a lot of anxiety, I'm feeling bad, and then I almost feel guilty for having that. Like, I should be fine, but I don't feel fine. And mm, yeah. I think having a brush with cancer, a brush with mortality, um, you still need healing in order to assimilate back into your life. And so I think that's a second population, people that are dealing with survivorship. And then I think the third population is those with metastatic cancer that, um, will likely die and how do they come to terms with that and so mm -hmm. I think uh, so I think we'll be doing studies in the distinct populations to parse out because each one has a little bit of a different theme and then some of the other work that we're doing we're going to be launching a study this year with a cancer patient and a family member and so oh, wow. both the patient and the family member will get MDMA together and then have two therapists mm -hmm. and work with them on how the cancer is yeah. affecting their relationship and so that's another study that we're going to launch this year sounds potentially very powerful thanks for sharing that i'm looking forward to seeing um the results of that and of your of your further work is there anything else you wanted to add um maybe some broad closing thoughts about where where the space is at um, <laughs> um sure i mean not much more but i think i would say that um some of my takeaway points have been that um there cancer depression and Emotional stress is a very real thing in cancer patients, and that probably affects their quality of life more than any other single aspect, and it needs to be addressed. I would say the group model looks very promising and needs to be investigated further. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think the last point I would make is that psilocybin is a very powerful medicine, but I would say it's a spark. You know, it's not a cure, and so it allows people to open up mm -hmm. to potential transformation and really if they work with their experience and work with a therapist and work with the center, they can lead to deep, meaningful change. But the drug in itself um, is not some sort of cure. It's not some magic bullet. And so I think learning how to use it properly is very important. Absolutely. Thank you for uh, making that very important point. It's not a panacea. Uh, it's a, something that can help you get somewhere. So thank you so much for your time, Dr. Agarwal. Um, hopefully we can have you on the show again.